Today, troops stationed far from home have plenty of options for communicating with their loved ones. They can use email, instant messaging, cell phones, satellite phones, or even video chat. But during World War II, American men and women at military installations depended on telephone centers to talk to their family and friends. The Bell System built and ran telephone centers at Army camps and naval stations across the United States, laying cable containing 20 billion feet of wire to serve these and other government projects by 1943. Even so, the long distance lines were often jammed. AT&T called the Bell System's wartime employees the Signal Corps of the Home Front. Like members of the Army Signal Corps, they played a crucial role in keeping the vital lines of communication open. Indeed, the training for operators at telephone centers was customized for wartime. They experienced gas mask drills, first aid instruction, and other preparations for anticipated attacks by the Axis powers. Operators quickly gained favor for their tireless work trafficking calls from anxious troops at telephone centers. At least one enlisted man was moved to wax poetic about these wartime soldiers of service. In his 1944 poem entitled The Unknown Soldier, Sergeant Jack Seligman praised telephone operators' contributions to the war effort. Here's an excerpt. She has no rank nor title, no uniform to wear, yet like the sentry standing guard, I know she's always there. No ribbons for display are hers, no medals to prove her might, yet she wears a smile as her fingers dial, for she knows she's part of the fight. I hope you enjoy War and the Telephone. This is a brief report on the impact of war upon a nationwide service. The background for this report is the normal growth in the business and social activities of the nation. It is characteristic of America that these activities should be reflected both in the number and in the daily use of telephones. As further background for the story are the switchboard conditions of pre-war years, when operators rarely faced unbroken rows of busy signals. Long distance. Technic Washington, Columbia 1212. Thank you. Washington. Columbia, one, two, one, two. Right. Your number, please. Over four, three, two, one. Thank you. Acme Construction Company. Let me talk with Mr. Miller, please. And a still further background is another pre-war service standard of speed and convenience. You want the main station in the living room? Yes, please. And the extension in the bedroom. Well, that's fine, Mrs. Harmon. Both telephones will be installed Tuesday morning. Well, Mr. Graham, I'm sure we can take care of your telephone needs in your new home. That Cedarhurst development is certainly growing fast. New houses are being built all the time. How long do you think it'll take us to get the service installed? Oh, we're ready now. We planned a cable to serve that section as soon as the land was cut into building lots. It's been in service some time. When do you expect to move, Mr. Graham? Friday. Our wife will be out there all day and can show your man where to put the telephone. I don't suppose there's any chance to get the phone in Friday morning. 
Yes, we can put it in then. I can arrange to have the installer there before noon. Great Scott, I never thought you folks would come that close. That's hitting it on the nose. Making hits is the objective around here. Well, I'd say this is a bullseye. Now I can move with no worries at all. Thanks very much. Now it's the type of service you want. Such standards of service were the general experience when the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939 brought war to Europe and to America a growing realization of the threat to her own welfare and security. Everyone will recall the headlines of those startling days, making plain this threat and telling how America prepared to meet it. And everyone will remember the local announcements in all sections of the country that indicated America's mobilization of her strength and resources. This local news was of the quick establishment of camps and training bases, many of which were remote from population centers and consequently far from existing lines of communication. Tremendous movements of population took place as men flocked to shipyards on the coasts of two oceans and the Gulf of Mexico, on lakes and on rivers, to airplane plants expanding with the challenge for production, to thousands of other centers pulsing with the effort to make America the arsenal of democracy. The call was all out for defense, and America responded on the double. The challenge to the telephone presented by this surge of activity is easily realized. Everywhere arose an immediate and abnormal demand for means to speed communication. The need was more circuits and quickly, so that the government could carry on its tremendous responsibilities of supervision and direction so that military and naval organizations could coordinate their far-flung and swiftly growing establishments, so that industry could assemble its machines and tools, its men and supplies, so that war communities crowded with new workers might have the communications service required for swollen populations, so that men in uniform congregated by thousands in new locations might have facilities for their new and special requirements so that the vast machinery of an aircraft warning system could enable a million and a half men, women, and children in civilian life to serve their country. Such urgent communication needs as these, of course, called for manufacturing on an unprecedented scale and the consequent use of metals and other materials in vast quantities. The technique of manufacturing telephones was so perfected that they could be produced at the rate of two and a half million per year. Lead-covered cable was needed in such increasing quantities that at one time the yearly production rate was 50 billion conductor feet. In the wire mills, that vital communications essential, copper, now so precious, and now so carefully allocated for purposes of war production, was converted from bars of metal to coils of wire in only 35 minutes. And even while supplies and equipment poured out from the factories and distribution centers as never before, the news of the day foreshadowed the difficulties soon to be faced. There is no better index of the telephone's war responsibilities than the use of long distance to unify and speed the universal war effort. The record for the capital city is a significant one, for it indicates how the wires are being used to stimulate and guide the nation's energies. The importance of keeping the lines free for these messages today needs little emphasis. And for every other war center, there is a similar record of constant and growing use of long-distance circuits.
The communication demand thus recorded for war centers, of course, requires more wires and cables, more telephones, more switchboards. And these would all be provided, of course, if the needed materials were obtainable. But for many months, the supplies of raw materials available for telephone purposes have grown steadily less. The effect of growing shortages was tempered at first by the development in the telephone laboratories of substitute materials and by the success of the telephone engineers in utilizing available supplies to the maximum effect. But there's practically no substitute for copper. Before Pearl Harbor, the supply of this metal going into telephone communications was measured in terms of tens of thousands of tons. What is allocated today must be devoted to one prime purpose, the winning of the war. So it is that as war conditions are influencing the activities of the nation, they particularly affect the communications service which helps to maintain and increase the tempo of these activities. The former service standard is a casualty of war. Today, this service has one basic function, to be the prompt and efficient servant of the nation's all-out drive for victory. To this end, the war emergency is bringing many opportunities for public cooperation. Ordinarily, Mr. Brown, we'd be glad to furnish you with an individual line, but we just don't have enough lines now. You see, to save materials for war purposes, the War Production Board has ordered us not to build any more, except those required for war purposes, our public health, our public security. We can give you service, but it will have to be the four-party service in Cedarhurst now. Well, I know there are restrictions, but I didn't think they'd make party lines necessary. I had one several years ago, but the other people used it so much, I couldn't make calls when I wanted to. It was always busy. Under today's conditions, Mr. Brown, we're suggesting that the people using a party line get together and plan ways of sharing it. A little knowledge of each other's problems should result in cooperation. Don't you think so? Certainly. No one kicks at sharing anything these days. That's right, Mr. Brown. And by getting along with a party line, you're really sharing copper. The government tells us that the copper in a mile and a half of telephone wire will keep a machine gun in action for four minutes. You don't need to say anything more. My son's almost 18, and he may be carrying a gun in the South Pacific himself someday. And I sure want him and his buddies to have their bullets. A four-party line will be all right with me. We'll make it do. Thank you, Mr. Brown. We're all glad to get along with Les if it'll help the boys who have the hard job ahead of them. My brother's out there, submarine duty. Well, now, if you'll tell me just when you're ready. Long distance. This is P.K. Smith, Victory 6480. Yes, sir. Get me Hartley Willis at Kansas City, Atwater 4567. Thank you. I'm sorry, the circuits are busy now. I will call you. Never mind it, operator. I can use the airmail. All right, sir. I'm sorry we were unable to complete the call for you. Long distance. I want to get Portland, Maine, 63421. This is Palisade, 1892. Thank you. Portland, Maine, route. Boston. Right. Boston. Portland, Maine. NC. 
Call operator 55 at Chicago, 618. Clear this circuit. Right. I'm sorry, sir. The circuits are busy now. I will call you. Better cancel the call, operator. I forgot that's a war send. All right, sir. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the men and women of the telephone are asking for your understanding and help. Carrying on with restricted facilities, they face a great responsibility and a growing one. On behalf of those on duty everywhere and of 50,000 colleagues now on other duty in uniform, they again remind you of the communications necessity until victory. War calls come first. Thank you.